I happen to have a, a friend, he's ordered himself a $4,000 mattress. Like, and, and maybe that's common for other people, but it's uncommon for me. And so his mattress right now is currently like in that stage of being stopped. How will this type of shipment enter into Canada? And I- Before we get started with the show, here's a quick word from our sponsor, Global Training Center. As trade compliance professionals, you want to make sure that your procedures and documentation are completed as correctly as possible to avoid any delays and possible fines. We provide a range of trade compliance courses that will fit your needs. From in-person or web training to recorded on-demand courses, we can train one or even thousands on your team through your learning platform or on our portal. We can even customize a private session for your team. Go to globaltrainingcenter.com to find out more. I am uh, excited about this. This is something new that we're doing and uh, in collaboration here with uh, some folks in uh, north of the border. So uh, uh, what do you think as uh, as we're launching this? I'm getting... um yeah, so so we're we're trying to build this a little more than what um, th- these are um, baby steps right now, but we are trying to make it um, more formal, where uh, we'll have uh, you know guest speakers and everything, but uh, and then we'll have more of a formal um, host to this as well. But for right now, you know, we're just hopeful, hope, hoping that this kicks off well and uh, and everybody. Um, enjoys this in Canada, like you said. And I I know we've talked to uh, Kim here in the past and she's told us there's really nothing like this in Canada. So, so we're hoping we can fill that void um, uh, only because we've been told again and, and again, very humbling. I I have no idea that people come up to us and like, Hey, you're from that podcast. It's like, Oh, really? (laughs) You know who we are. You know, it's kind of strange to see that, but, but anyway, and, and of course it's not, while I'm at the grocery store or anything, there's no way, but I meant, <laughs> I meant, I meant more like at, uh, at the conferences, so, which is really cool. So, so anyway, um, but for this one, we're going to kick it off with a more formal discussion on CARM, which, and I'll ask Kim here later, but, um, which I got an email earlier this week, I think Kim, or late last week that it's delayed. So I'm sure there's a lot of celebrations going on right now. So. <laughs> Some of us are, for sure. So, Andy, you can go ahead and introduce her since you know her very well. So, uh, the, For folks that had heard some previous podcasts, Kim uh, Campbell has been on our show before. Uh, Kim and I have a great history, and I think you reminded me in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Lord have mercy, it was in excess of 20 years ago if met in the war then. You must have been seven, and I must have been nine years old. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Kim Campbell has her own consulting firm now. She has a phenomenal uh, background. She's uh, with when I uh, met her, she was with Canadian Customs, uh, and uh, she actually was the supervisor uh, working the sort facility that I was running. So trust me, folks, she wasn't pulling any punches. This wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't till way after, uh, I had left Canada that we actually became friends because she was tough. <laughs> I'm telling you. But, uh, anyway, we, uh, have, you know, we worked together on implementing, uh, back in that day, the LVS program, if you remember. Um, and that was tough and there was a lot of things in that went on. And, uh, so anyway, saying all that, I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you, uh, Kim, and, uh, the, not only your background, obviously, again, you were with, uh, Canadian, Canadian customs. I know you'd worked with FedEx and there's been some others that you've worked with. Uh, I'll let you go into that if you care to. Her contact information, folks, will be um, with uh, our show notes. But Kim, also, uh, welcome to the show. And why don't you introduce our other guest here? My pleasure. So thank you, Andy, for always your kind words. Um, and, you know, I just think about that e-commerce thing. And Al and I both have a passion to, to re- re-energize that at some point. Because I'd be shocked to hear we haven't actually changed anything since you left. Um, so that's a, a big a bit of a hole we have to deal with in Canada at some point once we get past this CARM one. But um, I'm so pleased outside of the my the paid jobs you just, just discussed, um, I'm very passionate around my volunteer work. So um, Al and I have had uh, a couple of journeys together, and that's how I know Al and have a lot of respect for him. He's a great uh, colleague of mine in our not-for-profit place. We have worked on the board 
of the Canadian Society of Customs Brokers. Al still sits there. Um, and also, Al has just joined my existing one of my current boards, which is uh, the Associate, Canadian Association of Importers and Exporters. Al is a new board of uh, directors member, so very glad to have him here. I think this is my third time on the podcast. Uh, the first time we kind of did some general stuff, including CARM, obviously. A few weeks ago, we talked about CARM and Andy, the, all that work that we talked about. We reaped the benefits of that on Friday with the deferral. Um, so you gave some great words and advice about get to your politicians right in. And uh, we had um, been doing all that stuff for many weeks and, uh, and saw some success of that. And Al has been a big part of that journey. We wanted to talk a little bit about more about CARM today, kind of the, the technical pieces of it and how it's actually going to function, because we were supposed to be start starting the blackout period today of April 26, which would have been almost a three week of downtime as we were bringing up the new system. So um, Al and I can talk about that a little bit in a second. Um, but uh, I guess the other piece of the, the story is we are a little bit of a no man zone right now. Even though we know the next deferral date is October, all those pieces about blackouts and things like that, we're still not exactly sure what's happening. We know from the trade perspective, we're not in one, but customs claims they're implementing themselves still. Um, so we're still waiting to hear from them since the big announcement. But getting back to Al, he is a, a queer. I, a, Al, I think you're like one of those rare special birds that have had a career at one company. Uh, and you're just entering, I think your 40th year, right, at GHY? I'm actually past 40, You're Kim, past but let's not, talk, let's not talk about that. <laughs> so I was a senior VP there, uh, manages uh, both sides of the border, um, excellent colleague. The re other reason I really wanted Al to join us today is he's, again, one of those rare unicorns that's been actually testing in the system. There's only been uh, initially 75 companies, and they whittled it down to 40. So Al's got some really good insights that other people might have in terms of the trips and tribulations that one has trying to deal not only getting onto Quorum, but then what you can expect to see in there in this new uh, version that they will be launching at some at some point called R R2. Al's kind of the one I go to to say, like, am I missing something? Because, again, there's only a few people that are allowed to test. I've had the absolute privilege of uh, working under Kim on, on boards, and uh, I'm continually learning from her in that regard. She's She's been a pathfinder for the industry, and... So many of us uh, want to have her on a board, and uh, I've been had the privilege of serving as a vice chair under her as a board on the CSCB, and uh, now are, I'm I'm wanting to follow that because continuously learning in that regard. We'll we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about more about trade and how how CARM matters to particularly importers that want to bring things into Canada, and uh, look forward to seeing where we go in our dialogue here. Uh, we have valued and appreciated being a, a tester and more to come on that. Well, and that's one of those things when, when you're actually, you know, you, you have the concept of a new project, it becomes reality through lots of hours of meetings, planning, whatever, and then there's coding and whatever. And then where the rubber meets the road, you start testing the system and you start going through your normal process. And that's where you're actually going to pick up on some things. So we're going to get into that in a second. But let me stop for just a second for our listeners is, OK, uh, those that are probably in the brokerage industry, um, you know, customs brokerage, that is. And uh, transportation, they are probably familiar with CARM. But for the average Joe out there uh, like me that's dumb as a box of rocks, all right, what the Sam Hill is CARM? I mean, it's like, okay, is it, uh, you know, some new system? Is it some new candy bar? Is it some what? I mean, what do we got here? So, so Al, maybe I'll take a start and then fill in, uh, color in if I miss anything. I think the quickest way to explain it is we are replacing a legacy accounting system. So just like in the U.S., you have ACE um, and you file 7501s in there and do your post-summary corrections in there. Maybe some other things you interact with customs if they request documents on a CF-2829, that type of thing. This is basically what CARM is. So for the most part, our, our 7501s, we call them B3s now, have been automated for almost 40 years. So it's upgrading and, and putting into new technology that part of it. What, um, and also automating some other things. Like our post-summary corrections have been still paper. Our drawbacks are still paper. Um, so that part of the process is also being automated. That's all really good stuff. 
The problem has been we're not just now moving to a new technology. Customs has really changed some of the ways they fundamentally want to do business, business with in terms of data, um, the data sets, the technology suite is all changing under CARM. So net new for both the government and um, the private sector. For example, we're going to the cloud. We're starting to use API technology. I know it's pretty standard across um, most industry sectors, but for governments, that's still a little bit of a new thing. So um, so that part uh, we're bringing in. But the other part of it, which is really the consternation of a lot of it, is they've taken on the, uh, the calculations um, they never calculated before. I think we're the only country in the world that's calculating duties and taxes. And this is where we're discovering a lot of the problems. We can certainly get into that in a second. And then the other piece of it is some of the policy decisions they've made. In other words, we talk about the bonds. The uh, I did a webinar yesterday. I had tons of questions still on bonds. We call it release prior to payment, financial security. The U.S. knows it just as surety bonds typically. Um, and so those pieces, they've completely changed our landscape and all of this was supposed to happen on one magical day which was may 13th and, and now we seem to be heading to another october date uh, still to be uh, decided so al do you want to color in anything that you think was important i missed no kim i think you've covered that all uh, very well i'll leave it at that well let me let me jump in then is that all right so it's replacing the accounting system which generally I, all right, let me again i gotta dumb it down for for me. So hopefully, you know, the, the grade school folks out there that are equal to me listening to the show that can grasp onto it. So you have a shipment that comes in. It is, you've got some kind of an entry that's going into for release that that's, I want to <clears throat> clear this. I want to go ahead and have it delivered and, and begin to use it. But there is this time thing that is like the B3, as we said, that's Baker three for those. Um, cause I'm speaking Southern here. So B3 and it's, uh, when it's filed, that's saying, okay, when you do the release, I have a widget that comes in and say, it's a uh, case of coffee cups and coffee mugs or whatever it is. And a week later, uh, when the B3 is due, uh, it's still, it's coffee mugs. Here's the country of origin and much more detailed, uh, things than the harmonized tariff and the, uh, duties and taxes that are assessed against that. And that goes into the, what will now become CARM. That's the accounting side of things, right? Is the release part of that clearance process and, you know, and the entry and all, is that part of CARM also, or is that a separate system that is connected? It, it's definitely a separate system. So that's the good news, but where, and Al, maybe you can talk about this part. What has changed, though, fundamentally is they're adding new requirements for goods to be released. Uh, one is the now every importer has to have their own bond and you have to have what's a CARM client portal account. This is where the CARM portal comes in. So I guess I'll let Al maybe take that this part over. But I think there's a couple of things, though, um, like the CARM, even though it's accounting, they are starting to layer some requ uh, requirements around release. And they're doing it in a funky way. Like they're not saying you also you have to have a, a portal account. They're saying your financial security has to be in done via the portal. So in order for you get to get your goods released at the border and not have to pay duties and taxes, you have to have a CARM client portal account where your financial security maintains. Otherwise, you would have to have your goods stopped and have to do a paper entry, um, the C type, and you would have to pay at the border. So that's where it gets funky. It's not just accounting. So I'll I'll can certainly explain more. I like I like the space that you're in, Andy. Maybe maybe we've got that similar uh, import feel happening here. Just this morning, and and I did share with Kim just moments before this podcast because it it blows my mind. Just this morning, I had a contact of mine uh, send to me. Look, I just want to import a mattress. I, I just want a good night's sleep here in Canada. And so the person received the information that, hi, we no longer in Canada here accept goods on a delivered duty paid basis. We won't allow you to have that come in unless, as what you heard Kim make reference to, that you have a portal and that you're making direct payment with the Canada Border Services Agency. That's something that you're unaccustomed to in, in the United States. Like, I, I think there you get a better night's sleep. But in Canada, you're not getting that sleep. 
So what what's what this gentleman heard is that he couldn't import like that. And so he he reached out to say how does that relate? And Kim is 100% right. You can have things come through under the normal release process, but that has to somehow map to uh, your, I'll call it your your visa statement or your visa card number. And if, if I think of how things work in Canada here, I generally try to always go to a particular chain of gas station because those chains of gas station they have that record of my account and then I'll, I'll often get a rebate at the end of the year. So it's a little bit self-serving in that regard. Well, sometimes I might be somewhere other than where I'm normally traveling to and I, and I have to go to a different station and I'll call that in the case of instead of just using a broker like a company that I work for, I'll use one of the couriers or I'll use a freight forwarder to handle the work on my behalf because it's just easier well, what CARM does is it creates restrictions and it requires a much deeper planning in that regard. And so that was what wound up happening with this gentleman who just tried to import a mattress. He's like, Al, can I, how do I do that? And he was unable to do that as a result of CARM. And that was his experience. And Kim, if you want to tag team is a little bit of that insight that I shared with you, because that that does align with what you've said. The functionality exists, but the practicality is a challenge. Well, look, well, look, I, I, let, let me let me stop for a second. I, I want to give us for let me kind of give an example of what I'm hearing with the information you've provided and what the impact would be at the border in a sense. So folks, I mean, as, as we're looking through, you know, it's, there's so much e-commerce that is going on. You, you go online, you order something and, and you're, you're uh, ordering up something. It's going to be shipped to you. Okay, great. Um, in the midst of that, it could be coming up via the postal. It'd be coming up uh, via the couriers. It could be coming up through a, um, you know, a broker that's got a, a bunch of, you know, a, a trucks, whatever, you know, the scenario there is, let's just say that, um, and, uh, with a courier and, and postal both, you're going to have tens of thousands of packages that could be on one truck. So the equivalent of about, let's just say 30,000, um, parcels on a truck. Of the 30,000, based on what you just said, everybody's supposed to have all this, these requirements. So let's just say that in the beginning, at best, only 40% of importers have established themselves and gotten the, the bonds of whatever and, and done crossed the T's and dotted the I's and gotten the account. That means 60% has not. Well, that'd be a good number because it's actually higher than that. Okay. So 60%, you know, so another 70% have, if not, all right, whatever the case is. All right. So, but the point being is now folks, as this is coming across the border, that truck now has to be stopped, which means that only in this, if we're using 30, 70 uh, rule there, 30% of the freight could be, you know, free to go. But 70% has to have a manual process done because uh basically the Canadian government has established certain requirements that are so rigid there's no flexibility. What do you think is going to happen? A carrier, being the post office, being a courier, being a truck driver, whatever, is not going to be able to segregate out just the small percentage that could be going on out of all and it's all mixed together. So it's it's kind of like putting all the ingredients into a pot and when you're making chicken soup oh wait a minute now you've got celery you've got chicken you've got noodles and all that guess what uh 30 percent of your noodles are okay but 70 percent you're gonna have to pull out of that soup it is not gonna happen so it's going to delay all of your supply chain is that am, am i going like the pendulum is way too far andy you're full of beans here or whatever or what Oh, you're bang on the money. I will say, though, a couple of things. And Al's is definitely uh, can give a lot more nuance on the e-commerce uh, processes. 
um, we were heading exactly in that perfect direction uh, for May 13th um, because they had doubled down on all the requirements you just said. Probably mid-February, when industry started really pushing back on a lot of this stuff, we had some big policy changes. So um, there's definitely a big one that will occur even when we go live on the new date. Uh, And that is you don't have to have a portal and you don't have to have the RPP initially. As long as you have a business number, you're fine. So that a lot of that huge board of disruption uh, won't happen day one. But Andy, to your point, it, it's been punted down the road six months, 12 months. It's still going to happen, uh, you know, based on what we've seen so far. I think, though, with the LBS and the courier, this is a whole different complication because there is so many issues that have not been answered on how this is to look and feel. We don't have a good strategic footprint about how we need to re-engineer this program. It's the same kind of thing that we've had in place 30 years. Um, and we have a lot of competitive issues, like only certain people are allowed to play in the courier space and get certain benefits. Then we get into this whole complication about is it, if it's a person at home making a shipment versus if it's a company bringing in a bunch of stuff, we call it casual versus business. Those processes are completely different and confusing um, and have different requirements. So, Al, I know this is one of your sweet spots, so I don't know if you want to color that in a little bit. You know, it's tough because in Canada, I guess we speak two languages up here. And and as you've both alluded to, Andy and Kim, we've got the the courier, the e-commerce space, and I'll I'll call that our French space. And then our regular space, I'll call it the English space. So in the French space, what you've just said, the the couriers are the e-commerce aspect. Like in the United States, I think of it as your uh, your Type 86 or your Section 321. In Canada, what we have is most uh, couriers are having things come up, and in many cases, they're they're processing that, or the couriers acting as the broker and they're processing that. Um, what is going to and is happening is that uh, you wind up with two brokers involved in that case, one being the courier and and one being the the regular broker. And that creates issues when it comes to reconciliation and account settlement at month end. And I imagine we'll talk about that in more detail later. But for things that are coming up in the e-commerce space, what customs brokers or couriers have done is they've stepped forward and they've stepped forward because they have to not because necessarily they want to. They've stepped forward because they have to. And they've said, hi, put that on our business number. Put that on our statement of account and, and we will cover that. So people like Andy, people like Kim, people like Al, we're not acting as the importer of record. We're, we're merely part of a, a facilitation of trade. So that that's what's happening on, on an ongoing basis here in Canada. And, and we're trying to work through nuances of that, as Kim alluded to in the e-commerce space. In the other story that we started with, uh, the, I mean, you know, you, you took us down a different journey, Andrew, but I'm going to take us back to mattresses. I happen to have a, a friend who uh, clearly my friend has got better taste than I do. He's ordered himself a four thousand dollar mattress, like, and maybe that's common for other people, but it's uncommon for me. And so his mattress right now is currently like in that stage of being stopped. Like they're concerned as to who and how that's going to be imported. So that's that's left that Type eighty six or that uh, CLVS stream in Canada, and it, it it's created a pause as to. How will this type of shipment enter into Canada? And I, I think that was part of where your question or your comment was going. And maybe maybe we'll turn that back to you as to see where the journey progresses, as well as the the stops and checks and balances that Kim was referring to. Like we've got importers that use multiple brokers. We've got the whole registration and delegation challenge that you had dealt with in ACE that we really struggled with here in Canada. And we're still struggling with it, as Kim alluded to, one in three. And then we've got, well, what about bonds? What about RPP? Like we start using too many acronyms and I'll, let, let's, let's shift that back for a bit. Well, to your point here, here's where I was also going is that one is with the disruption of <clears throat> some of the supply chain, some of the requirements that's going to delay the handling of some of these trucks and, and shipments and whatever. Well, the resources for Canada Customs 
it's going to be tied up in dealing with that because all of those items now have become an exception. Then you've got the formal entries that are like the, 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 the mattresses and the, and some of these other big shipments that are coming through and whatever. And they're needing resources as well to process those entries. Uh, just for release, we're not even, you know, we still need to talk about the accounting side, but on the accounting side, there's still, all right, it, it's like you've got to have your business registration number and the accounts and, and, and different things set up appropriately. And if they're not, guess what it is a manual process is slowing it down. So it becomes another exception. So you, the, what I'm hearing out of this car, and we're just scratching the surface is that the exceptions are going to become the norm, which means that more, you know, an exception requires manual processing. So instead of, yeah, we're going to come up with a new system, um, and it's a smart system that's going to do all these wonderful things. Well, from the sound of it, thus far, the way this is set up, it's the dumbest dadgum system I've ever heard of because it's not going to, it, it's, it's not accounting for the exceptions. And therefore the government's one thing you've got the, yes, they're government uh, officials being, you know, customs agents and other governmental agencies, but it's going to put the onus on them at the ports and at the border and all these other things just dealing with the exceptions. And I guarantee you there's going to be folks that are going to get their knickers in a knot over this and be very upset and start chewing on these folks at the border when it's not their fault, but they just have to deal with it. So they're going to become the proverbial pooper scoopers at the end of a parade. Andy, if I, if I just look, Kim, I'd like to just interrupt for just one moment. Okay. Like you're a hundred percent right, Andy. And, uh, the exception has become the rule and what is absolutely unprecedented. And I believe this started the conversation and I, I do look to uh, Kim and quite frankly, hold her up in this regard and that Kim is being the past chair of the Canadian association of importers and exporters and past chair of many other organizations, as well as the organizations that want her to join and be part of the chair. She stood in front of the Canadian, um, trade committee at the house of commons in Canada. And, and, and she shared what you just said, Andy, and she, she shared that pathway and it, it opened the eyes of many associations and, and what has been unprecedented as unheard of. It's it, quite frankly, it's unbelievable. 22 associations stepped forward to the house of commons trade committee and said, hi, this isn't going to work as it's currently designed. Like the, it, we recognize that there's certain foundation things that are, are solid and we recognize a change needs to happen. But uh, it, the, under the leadership of what occurred with the Canadian Association of Importers and Exporters and the 22 other associations that signed up, we saw something that was unprecedented here north of the border. And, and Kim, I, I'm sorry, I'm probably stealing some of your thunder, but uh I'll let you carry it from here because you, you know the nuances much better than I do. Well, I don't know that I do, actually. That's why I wanted you to be here because you have a lot of information here that I don't even necessarily have. So um, we're a good team that way. I will go back to what Andy just said. You're 100% right. And, and if anyone in, you know, in Canada, maybe everyone in Canada has probably heard about it. Maybe uh, some folks in the U.S. Have, has heard. We have a bit of a scandal around an app called Arrive Can that was put in during covid and just going through, there's a lot of investigations about that. But to get back to what you said, Andy, their union uh, leaders have come out and talked about that period of time. And the officers were forced into having to help travelers fill in uh, data on an app that nobody could figure out that they hadn't had any input on as officers, hadn't been tested properly. Um, and just the consternation and the stress and all the havoc that rose this is exactly a prelude to what we're going to probably see with CARM on the, on that on that side of it. So uh, apparently we still haven't learned our lesson, but hopefully because we have a bit of a pause, um, people will be starting to look at that because that for sure is the downstream impacts uh, for sure. All right. So we've, we've just, like I said, kind of scratched the surface here. <clears throat> and as we're going through, I mean, I, I, you know, again, I wanted to put this in to, to qualify, you know, it looks like we're kind of, 
beating up the folks that have put this together. There's look, folks, you know, it's easy to play armchair quarterback. I understand that if you have been part of the group that has developed this, uh, and there's a lot of heat spotlight coming to the, okay, fine. I'm going to offer an invitation. I would love for folks from the CARM project, come on here. Let's talk about it. But the point being is, as we're looking at this, <clears throat> got to understand those Canadian customs officers in particular. Um, I have a lot of respect for them. Um, we did some great things while I was up there, I, you know, and I, I've watched them. Same thing on CBP's part as, as well. This is going to be a two way street because there's going to be export issues. And I'm sure CARM has got some things <laughs> we haven't even got to the export side. But if the border is getting going to have some challenges on the Canadian side for Canadian imports, but it starts backing things up. Uh, I guarantee you there's going to be issues here on the U.S. side of the border going, what the heck's the deal? We got a traffic jam or what? So as we're looking at that again, Canadian citizens are going to see a disruption on things. So here's where I want to go next here is with all these things, and it gets pretty complex. I get that. What do we need to do? What What's the average citizen need to do in this? I mean, you know, who needs to be involved? You talked about 22 associations involved. That's great, but we don't need to leave it to where there's a delay. Okay, fine. There you're in this quiet period or, or whatever it is. Where, where do we need to go? Let's take advantage of this and, and, you know, tell some of these folks not no, but hell no on the way it's going. It's like, you've got to make changes. You can't, you can't, one size does not fit all. So I feel like the good news is part of the journey that Al talked about um, doing the House testimony is there is a motion that actually went into the House of Commons late last week where this same committee um, is going to be take, undertaking a study of the whole entire CARM project and make recommendations. So this is now the work that is ahead of us over the next few weeks, few months, um, not only to work with the 22 that have put forward ideas, but we're really hoping to work with that committee. And it could be what you just said, Andy, like we've asked for, can we provide, can you provide us a third party to come in and oversight the project? Because obviously there's a big problem with tr between trade and customs right now. We kind of need a third party in there that is not you know, tied to either one that can lead us out of this and maybe come forward with a footprint or an action plan to deal with some of these writ large issues. We're certainly asking for um, an auditor general report. We have a lot of concerns about how the project's been managed. Uh, we got other few recommendations like that, but I think these next few months are going to be critical and the recommendations of that committee should be helping us with the way forward, in my opinion. Al, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I guess, Andy, as you made reference to it and Kim punctuated, yes, there's a pause in place right now. And there's a pause in place because there was concern. Um, you also referenced, Andy, and I, and I really applaud this, the officers, the front line, th those people are the people that make a difference every day, each and every moment. And uh, uh, what wound up happening by the the more senior government officials in the whole CARM program as they reference uh, that, hi, we're, we're, we're pausing because they haven't had the appropriate time to be trained or to be brought up to speed. And it just so happened that it was the same time as a, a union thing was in, in place in Canada. And, and the government uh, uh, customs officers have said, yeah, we haven't been trained. We haven't, we haven't had the opportunity to, to be able to make this project work on behalf of what the what our government needs and our government and as as Kim and the associations that she has led and belongs and channels, we, we know there needs to be an ace like solution here in Canada. We absolutely support that, but what we support is 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 that pause to take a look at some of the foundation to make sure that. And Kim, you can speak to the the areas that came forth at the the House of Commons committee. Like, what will it take to make it work? And I would I would turn to you to punctuate some of that because that that will be what brings us all forward together, and that's what we all want. 
Yeah. And I think um, just to like highlight a few things, we're really concerned about some of the mandated things. Like there's got to be options. We've always said, why can't we have options? Why does an importer have to use the portal? You know, people can file entries and do work on behalf of clients in the U.S. Um, uh, without having a client being on the ACE system. So um, these are the things that we are keeping. Why do these things have to be mandatory? Why does everyone need to have a bond? Like even people that are importing a few times a year are forced into having to provide financial security. We look to other countries around the world. We have a VAT tax here. Um, they're, they're now insisting that we include that in the financial security calculations that importers will have to pay for. In, in other countries of the world, they don't do that. If you're a registered importer and have been for three years, you don't have to have financial security. So these are the things we want to start pushing back on. We have been pushing back, but now I feel we have a little more. We have people now hearing it and seeing it differently. I think, though, too, the biggest thing for us, too, is the calculations. That was, I believe, one of the biggest reasons um, why we couldn't go live is now that the government is making the calculations and telling the importer how much they owe, we're still seeing grave issues around those being correct. So it's kind of, I guess, the mandated stuff is the systems performing are enough people on it are really what kind of pushed the decision that we had to delay right now. Is that fair, Al? Yeah, would it be fair also to say, Kim, like when, when I take a look at what the CARM program was, it was it was endeavored to be almost like a one size fits all. And I know in your in your um, profession, Kim, in your you, you deal with trusted traders like the the upper echelon at uh, of, of traders within CBSA. And it, it, to me, CARM almost feels like. Uh, like I think of them as a fastener and they might be a screw and yet, you know, the rest of us are nails and, you know, Carm was this hammer and uh, a hammer doesn't work that well with screws. And so they, they tried to put, they tried to make that happen fitting a, like a round peg in a square hole or whatever, however that would be said. Uh, is, is that fair as to what Carm tried to, to achieve? And, and now within the pause, it's just, it's looking to be more aware of how to make things. Yeah. And again, you're just hundred percent, Alan, some of the original overarching themes they, they didn't deliver on, like there was supposed to be one uh, declaration type where you could get release in accounting because the, de- the data is basically the same. So th- at some point they stripped that. We're not really sure why. Uh, so there was a lot of failures along the way too. I think for me, the biggest part is uh, it's all outsourced to a third party that was not a customs official. Um, so those are things too, we're going to be challenging our government to, if we can't deal with it outright, let's have the plan to bring it back in house. Well, let me, let me jump in here. Cause it's, we're going to have, I, I, we're going to have to have another show on this or maybe a series on this because there's quite a bit. The thing that, uh, I would say that, you know, the takeaway folks that are listening to this, I think it's paramount that you listen from a standpoint that you're going to need to get involved. You need to, your company needs to be involved. You as an individual need to be involved as well as any trade associations that you're involved to stop and think about it. Um, retailers out there that are importing, you know, large shipments and all that, this stuff is going to get in the way of that, you, the smaller, quite frankly, it sounds to me like there's going to be a huge increase, uh, in volume of entries being submitted to the Canadian clearance systems because of the requirements. It's like, it's no longer this mass, you know, let me do a group of entries or a group of shipments. It's going to be individual shipments. Well, guess what? That's like a dime holding up a dollar. It's going to be the small dollar shipments. They're going to hold up the bigger ones and the bigger ones still have requirements. So uh, all I'm getting at is that we're not going to solve this here. What I'm I'm trying to emphasize the importance for you folks in Canada. And I'm talking not only the large cities, but the small ones is you're not going to be able to get your goods timely. You're not going to be able to, it's going to cost you more money. It's going to cost the government more money. Stop and think also, if you are a Canadian agency, uh, the, the post office up there, Canadian Post, your budget is going to get blown out by exceptions. Are you in, if you're in the post office and you're in management and you've got a budget, are you prepared to go back to the Canadian government and go, uh, we're going to have to have more money because of CARM's implementation is costing us more money. 
And quite frankly, they're going to say, well, there's only so much money to go around. So you're going to have to go back in and look at what are you going to be cutting? And if you're going to cut services, then the average citizen is going to lose out. Go ahead. I, I don't want to make this about a sleep at night factor, but to me, that's a little bit what it is. And I'm going to paraphrase to part of the story is like importers will use multiple brokers, just like the gas station example that I made reference to. If we take a look at this particular situation of, of the mattress that I talked about, well, I I have no problem with that friend of mine, even though he's a friend of mine. I happen to be a broker. Most people don't necessarily have friends that are broker. Most people don't know what a broker is. So so this, this gentleman heard that he couldn't get his mattress in to sleep at night. Okay. He's now told he has to register and delegate that you've made that Kim's made reference to. He doesn't even know what the heck that is. Like he, he happens to own a business, but he doesn't know what that is. And then he's told that he has to post security for, for, for a shipment that's coming in. Trade is being hampered and hindered into Canada. It absolutely, everything you just made reference to, it will impact, it will impact everybody. Uh, it's only meant to channel things from a, a business standpoint, but how it's being rolled out is impact, impacting and hindering beyond that and the whole sleep at night and negatively impacting that, that that that's it's it's a huge negative factor there absolutely where should somebody if they want to find out more about this and or get involved should they reach out to the two of y'all or or what what would be the next step i think last time and we can we can do it again i do we do have a one pager that kind of can point people to um some of the websites and give them some resources including to go onto the carm client portal and register so that would be a good reference obviously al and i are certainly available if people need to reach out and have a little more technical support um, and then we would also recommend that they contact service providers as well. Their customs brokers um, are also great resources for the existing importers. Um, but those would probably be my, my initial ones. Al, do you have anything else you think would be good to offer? You know, it's an importer program. The Canadian Association of Importers and Exporters, which is who Kim was the past chair of, they've done an outstanding job in creating a flowchart that quite frankly uh, has pathways as to who should register, how many should register, when should they register, who should pay, uh, how do you interact in that regard and other considerations. I think that's an outstanding document and flowchart that's put together because there's no one pathway. We all take different pathways. And, and I, I think they've done a really good job capturing that. So I, I would outreach to that uh, that particular association and, and ask for that document. I feel like probably Al or I could do that work and, and either share it with you or let, or let you know. <laughs> Surely to God, two board members of the association should be able to take that one on. No, definitely. Well, folks, let, let me just say this is that we are, we'll have their contact information, both Al and, and Kim's uh, contact information, uh, with our show notes and all of that. Along with, uh, I will say also that we've got some other really cool topics coming up with our Canadian focused shows here and all that. And, and Kim, uh, in addition to the CARM, which is a huge, complex undertaking there's another little thing here that uh, we're looking at for a future show here that we're going to be talking about yeah, Andy, thank you so much i'm very excited to um to say we'll bring uh will pelleron on from mcmillan he's a partner there and really um probably one of our best trade lawyers especially on this topic in canada so um we are a little bit different on the forced labor file between us and canada uh, you guys have border prohibition we have that we have a couple of other things, and one is going to be uh, mandated as of May 31st. You have to file your first report for larger importers. Now, when I say larger, it's probably smaller than you think, um, but those people will have to be putting in a report by May 31st. So we're going to have Will come on and just walk everyone through that, um, and that will uh, he's, he's excellent and really looking forward to that conversation with folks. Well, fantastic. Hey, listen, folks, uh, share us, like us, uh, forward this on to, uh, other, uh, your friends and colleagues and whatever in the industry. 
Um, and, and we'll go from there. Al, listen, uh, thank you so much for being on our show and Kim as well. It, it just, there, we've just scratched the surface and I'm going to tell you, there's a lot more interest in this, uh, and a lot more that needs to be getting into, uh, involved as far as activities. When you start peeling back the onion on this carm, uh, I got to tell you, it, 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 it gets me madder in the wet hen on some of the stuff I've seen. It's, it's like, this is, this is not good. <laughs> Andy, I'd like to think north of the border. We, we like, we, we value how we learn and partner with us, our friends south of the border. And as Kim alluded to there, you've got forced labor. We're, we're really behind on that. You're, you're decades ahead of us and we're trying to catch up. Carm, we're not quite as far behind in our, our, our four letter word compared to your three letter word of ACE, but we're, uh, we're looking to partner and learn from each other. So th- thank you for all the collaboration that has occurred in that regard. Well, folks, listen, uh, we're, this has uh, been a great show. And, uh, with this, we've just scratched the surface. Like I said, there's going to be a lot more in this. Um, and we're looking for advertisers as, and supporters and sponsors and, and all of that good stuff. So if you're interested, reach out to us, Simply Trade Podcast. Um, but uh, with that, uh, again, Al and Kim, thank you so much. Lalo, uh, with all that, we're going to sign off. Thank you very much for joining us. Simply Trade is brought to you by the generous contributions of Global Training Center. You can follow the show and GTC on LinkedIn or Twitter and other social networks. Make sure you check out the show notes in the description for a full rundown of today's show with all the important links. Also, make sure that you share this with a friend and subscribe on your favorite streaming platform. We really like hearing from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to rate and review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest in the show or would like to sponsor Simply Trade or suggest any topic you would like for us to discuss, please contact us via email at simplytrade at globaltrainingcenter.com or you can DM us on Twitter at simplytradepod. Thank you again for the privilege of your time. Happy trading. Simply Trade is not a law firm or an advisor. The topics and discussions conducted by Simply Trade hosts and guests should not be considered and is not intended to substitute legal advice. You should seek appropriate counsel for your own situations. These conversations and information are directed towards listeners in the United States for informational, educational, entertainment purposes only and should not be substituted for legal advice. No listener or viewer of this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of information on this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel. Information on this podcast may not be up to date depending on the time of publishing and the time of viewership. The content of this posting is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error free. The views expressed in or through this podcast are those of the individual speakers, not those of their respective employers or Global Training Center as a whole. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast are hereby expressly disclaimed.